Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Live Life Liberated podcast. I'm Wendy McConnell. Today, we have Chris Hyman and Kyle Malmstrom. Did I say that right? Kyle, did I you say did. it right? All right. You did, you did. Yeah, Thanks, you Wendy. You hit, you hit mine right on, too. Okay, good. Oh, now I my job is done. What's going on today, guys? <laughs> yes. Well, Chris and I, are, uh, we're doing a podcast today on a piece of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that specifically affects high net worth families and kind of a solution set. So there's another podcast on all of the issues with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that you should probably listen to. But this one is going to be a specific subset speaking specifically to the sunsetting of the estate tax exemption. What are we talking about there, Chris? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Kyle. Yeah, we're talking about, um, in particular, estate taxes, and with that, the federal estate tax. And really what the Tax Cut and Jobs Act did is it doubled the exemptions that you can utilize, which was around $6 million for an individual, $12 million for married couples. Um, it basically doubled that to $12 million in 24. But really, I, w- I want to go a little further back. So what this, so people understand what the estate tax is, and it's it's as it sounds, it's it's when you leave money to whoever you're leaving money to, whatever is in your taxable estate, um, and they call it taxable estate for a reason, um, so unless you shelter it, uh, the government's going to take a piece of that if you're worth enough. Um, so what the Tax Cut and Jobs Act did is it made it so you had to be worth more than you originally had to be in order for this tax to have a, actually have an implication. And so really this, ta- this tax dates back to 1916. It, it, it had periods of stop and go prior to then as wartime funding efforts, but in 1916, it took hold. And it's changed. There's been a major change to it in some way, whether a difference in tax rate or a change to the exemption level about 14 times since then. Where we stand right now is we're at actual historic highs when it comes to the exemption. So right now, we're at about 12.9 million for 2023 for an individual exemption. And we're at about, call it 26, you know, that's close to 26 million for a married couple. That's set to go to a little bit over 13 million next year. But then in 2026, if no one does anything based on current law, it's set to sunset back down to call it around the six to 7 million range for an individual. And what an exemption is, is uh, we can use an example, is let's say someone is worth $20 million right now, married couple. Well, as we just went over, the joint marital exemption is at $26 million. So they would they actually wouldn't have any federal estate tax implications because they're within that exemption level as a, as a, as a married unit. Now, let's say that same couple, instead of worth 20, was worth 100. Well, now they'd have a problem because now, yes, they, the $26 million is exempt, but the residual would be taxed. And it'd be taxed pretty pretty hefty. It's it's a it's a forty percent tax rate currently. Um, Ouch. Yeah. So that's that's that that's sort of what the federal state tax is. So what we're getting to is for people that are at that level now, or you know, projected to be at that level, there is some planning that needs to be done. There's some considerations yep. that need to be made if they want to if they want to get ahead of it. So there's been a holiday, Chris. What you're talking about is there's a holiday for the last four or five years. Well, it's going to go on for a total of six years. Trump signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which moved that exemption up. So people that were between that 12 to 26 million range really had a holiday from dealing with this. And now, to your point, Chris, that is going to sunset without the Democrats or the Republicans doing anything. The estate tax number is a political volleyball number that they push back and forth. Biden uh, and Bernie Sanders both ran at like three, three and a half million Build back better would have sent it back to three, three and a half million. So that number moves around. We're in a situation right now where if the Democrats and the Republicans don't do anything, it sunsets and they kind of get to point the finger at Trump and say, hey, you didn't make it permanent, right? So this problem is going to start to affect millions of more people in the United States. Yeah, very, very correct. I mean, it's really going to open up the floodgates. There's there's a lot of folks who don't have a problem at 26, 27 million, right, married folks that will have a will have a big problem at, you know, 13 million. And we actually, you know, here at, here at Centura, and again, nobody has the proverbial crystal ball, but we actually have conviction that it's going to be, it's going to affect even more people. Um, 
you know, we were one vote away, basically three times we're one vote away back in 2021 from Build Back Better passing. This would have actually reduced the individual exemption closer to 3.5 million and really 7 million for joint. So that's even that that's even more people that that it would affect. So 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 we established all right, 2026, there's an issue. The other podcast on this is going to tell you, hey, you should probably get your planning done because if you haven't, if you don't, if you wait until late 2025, you're not going to find an estate planning attorney. So you want to get ahead of this thing. But in particular, when we think about the estate tax and we think about, okay, hey, the, the second spouse passes away, or if you're an individual, you pass away, you have nine months to pay this tax. And what happens when someone has, right? You have to pay this tax and then you have to say, well, where am I going to pay it from? And you could pay it from liquid investments. And then people have businesses, they have real estate, they have illiquid alternatives, they have gold, whatever it is, the cryptocurrency, they have all these different assets that could be used to pay the estate tax. Some of them have better liquidity attributes than others. Some of them is a better opportune time to sell them or their more readily marketable than other assets. And so thinking about like, hey, how does the estate tax get paid is one of the things that we talk with our clients about. Chris, one of the things we also talk to our clients about is like, hey, what happens at the end of your life? Who can you leave the money to, right? Yeah, no, that's a great point. It, we really categorize that into into three, right? Three, three simple buckets. You're either going to leave it to heirs of your choosing, which is overwhelmingly typically family, right? But also could be friends. You know, if you have children, it's typically you're going to leave a bulk of your um, net worth to. There's also charity as number two, and there's also government. And so, you know, we, we ask, we ask people, we ask our clients, um, you know, of, you know, here's, here's your projected estate value. Here's your projected, you know, assets that you're going to be able to pass on. Of those three, where, where do you want this to go? And Kyle, what do you what do you what do you think is the least friendly or the, or the least likely answer uh, when we ask that question? People tell us, "Hey, I paid a truckload of income tax during my life. Why do I have to pay it again at the end?" IRS is the last one. Very very true. So we're not saying this is everyone, and obviously we always establish you know facts, assumptions, and goals. And you know, to be frank, some some people aren't as concerned with it. Um, yep, that's right. But but most most individuals do not and and uh, you know and uh, married couples do do not want to leave the bulk of their assets to to the government or, or you know or a very significant percentage of their assets to the government. They'd like to do planning where they can stave that off. And it's our I mean, it's it's uh, it's our suggestion that they get ahead of that sooner rather than later. It's easier to get ahead of it much much sooner than to wait and kind of kick it down the kick it down the road and deal with the debt. So 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 Chris, let me tag along right there because. Yep. An important point needs to be made about, a, I don't know, vast majority of our clients are business owners and they own this business. <clears throat> and when you think about, okay, hey, what happens when you die is they tally up all the assets in your taxable estate and they decide whether or not how much you're going to owe in income tax. And part of that equation is your business. And that business is illiquid. And if you have family members in that business and you're trying to transfer that business down to the next generation and 90% of your net worth is in this business, and there's an estate tax of $20 million and the money has to come from the business. That means you have to sell part of the business. And that is where the rub lies or real estate. Hey, I got a bunch of real estate. I spent my whole life acquiring all this real estate. I got multifamily. I got single family. I got a whole portfolio of it. And now I have to go sell some of it. Okay. Well, in a high market, probably more palatable because I'm selling at a high, but what if you were selling in 2009 and 10, right? You're getting rock bottom prices for the, the properties that you got to sell. <clears throat> so illiquid assets and the ability to maneuver and how you raise the liquidity to pay the tax. Cause again, it's due in nine months is the issue, right? For what we're talking about today. Like, how do you solve that issue? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and we find all too often people are left solving that issue, you know, closer to the end, which can just, which can just cause so many problems and so many issues down the line. So yeah, that's, that is really what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's creating the liquidity now, creating the liquidity piece now and planning for it. So it really just gives you control, right? It gives you control of your estate, control of your decisions. So you're not kind of held captive at that towards the, you know, towards the end of your run. 
for sure. Flexibility, optionality, control. And hey, I don't want a new business partner with my family. You know, I don't want to have to sell it to do an ESA. There's, there's so many variant, there's so many variables. But yeah. to your point, Chris, you're dead on. If you wait to the end, it's it's a problem. It gets very difficult to do the planning. Absolutely. Because- well, I mean, Kyle, let's take that same example of the hundred million, right? Let's say seventy-five million of that is tied up in a privately held business, right? And uh, you know, when you get down the line, you're going to have to make some some quick moves in order to in order to provide that that. I mean, I mean, the worst thing you can do is just leave that to your children, right? Without any pre planning, because now they're just going to have to do some sort of fire sale. Um, it's doing nine months, which isn't going to be tenable, right? Doable, but not not tenable. So it's uh, really the question is, you know. Do you do you do the planning now, or you know, relatively soon, or do you wait further along when it's going to be harder to harder to make moves? Yeah. So we did. Look, the job here is, in my opinion, not to sell you on the idea that there's an estate tax. There, we do you know, we do need you to know that the number is coming down in terms of the exemption. Uh, you need to take some action, but you should either decide you want to take action or not, and then it becomes a question of what are the solutions, right? And so the most common one that the state, if you go to your state planning attorney, right, the first one that most, probably the most common one we see is a, is a top, is a strategy called squeeze, freeze, and burn. Can you elaborate on what that is, Chris, for the audience? Yeah, sure. So, um, and there's, and there's a lot of different strategies. So yeah, so as Kyle mentioned, if you, many estate planning attorneys, they're going to look to see how many of these different strategies make sense into a particular fact pattern, right? Into, and, and there's different ones that'll fit different clients, right? Different solutions for everyone. But what it essentially is, is first you're squeezing down the value of any particular assets that you're trying to move outside of your estate. You know, can, can, that can be done through a variety of ways, but you know, it can be discounting um, techniques. There's, there's, and so you're really just squeezing down the value, and then you're freezing it. So you're gonna gift it outside. You're gonna, you're gonna sell it. You're freezing it in time at that squeeze down value, right? And then many times, how this is structured is there's actually a burn that comes back into the estate in the form of income taxes on the growth of those assets that you, you know, transferred outside. It further burns down the estate. So we won't, it's not the, within the context of this podcast to go over some of those strategies, but there's, there's a whole, a whole bevy of them. And, uh, and we're, we're familiar with many and um, most estate planning attorneys, when they have clients of any significant wealth, they're going to, they're going to look and see which, which of these strategies we can put into place. But that said, Kyle, what, what can go, what, what can be an issue there, right? And you have a client that has a large enough estate. Control, and, yeah. complexity, right? That's. <laughs> That is a common strategy, and and Chris, you were right. There's tons of different strategies. I probably teed teed that up incorrectly. There's lots of different ways to conquer it. One of the ways they do it, that's one way they do it. And to your point is that they have complexity, and and there's simpler ways to do it, right? And so one one of the ways that we want to chat about is an insurance trust where you put life insurance in it, right? So here it comes. Here's the pitch on life insurance. It's really not about that. People understand kind of how life insurance works, but we're going to cover some of those basics. But then it's really, how does your team work with you to craft it in a way that creates the most flexibility, the least amount of cash flow pain, gives you all the optionality you want, creates liquidity when you need it. Right? There's some real advantages to the strategy, but there's also some real nuance into how you design it and implement it that works for clients. And so to quickly cover the benefits of insurance, right? Chris on the spot right here, top four reasons why you do a life insurance trust. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, a, there's a variety of reasons. Well, well, number one, there's there's tax advantages to uh life insurance, right? And we like and we actually like to, you know, split that into four. And that's the your the underlying assets grow tax deferred. The and then really two and three of those benefits are you can pull out tax redistributions, be, be it in the way of uh, w- uh withdrawal up to the cost basis or policy loans. And then the death benefit is received tax free. Um tax uh, also free. <laughs> if structured <laughs> properly, I should add in that, right? Yeah. If, if structured properly, which we you know you're gonna and it, any planners that understand how to do this are going to structure properly. And then, um, yeah. So, I mean, and then uh, that's, that's the, the tax advantages of life insurance. And then the benefits of just having life insurance for this strategy are number um, we we've kind of already hit it. It's, is it, it's a way to provide a liquidity bucket outside of the estate 
in a simplistic way that doesn't that that doesn't have you lose control, right? We're 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 big on be, having being flexible. We're big on the client maintaining control of their assets of their estate. And so, you know, asset control is is humongous and is a and is a major benefit of this. And like we mentioned, it's it's an immediate it's an immediate liquidity event at death. You know, it's a it's it's instant liquidity into the you know to the heirs or so, to the trust. Yeah. And, so it uh, creates the liquidity right when you need it, right? Right when you pass away. So if you're in a bad market cycle, you're in a bad, uh, you don't want business partners to join in with your firm because you don't want to sell it. Insurance creates a liquidity bucket on your passing. It's right there, available to pay for the estate tax. It is perfectly timed. And you can't discount the tax-free nature of it. The death benefit of an insurance policy is income tax-free, capital gains tax-free, and if you structure it where that policy is not in your taxable estate, it is estate tax-free. Those are the major components, right? So you have tax-free liquidity when you need it, which gives the family all the optionality. Now they can choose, hey, I want to sell that piece of real estate because the time is right. I've always hated that piece of real estate. Now knock yourself out. Do whatever you got to do and keep the cash. But if you don't want to do that, you have you have a contingency plan for those worst case scenarios where market fundamentals don't line up with the timing of your unfortunate passing. Like that's the trick. Give your beneficiaries the control and the optionality. And so insurance, there's the taxable estate and then there's the tax sheltered side of the estate, which is you guys have all heard of trusts and you set up trusts outside of the estate and you have a trustee and there's some control issues. You got to make sure you have a different trustee and things like that. We can walk you through all that stuff, but you put this trust out there and to what Chris was talking about or what we were talking about on squeeze, freeze and burn was you could transfer a piece of the business out there. You get limited in how much you can give every year. So today you can give $17,000 per beneficiary. So you and your wife, it's 34,000 times the number of beneficiaries. So I don't know, on the upper end, a couple hundred grand, maybe you get limited to one, you know, 34 grand. I don't know what your situation is, how many beneficiaries you have, but you can't give, if you're worth a hundred million dollars and your business is growing 10% a year, you're not even going to make a dent in the estate tax gifting that tiny amount of money out. But where you can make a dent is through the leverage of insurance, because if you give 200 grand out a year, you can probably buy $20 million worth of insurance. And now you do have some leverage there that makes a substantial impact. Maybe you need 40 million. I don't, you know, we're just throwing out some numbers here. It's yeah, that absolutely. trick of a, how do you use that leverage, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly it. Exactly it. You hit the you hit the nail on the head, right? It's uh it's kind of feeding the engine, right? It's it's hey you're 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 setting forth a set number of you know a set amount of dollars, and we like to get very uh, creative with uh, premium design and optimization there. But uh you know you're kind of feeding this death benefit engine that's there. Um, that again is going to serve as that kind of instant liquidity, you know, going into the you know going to into that trust. So um, so Chris, can I in the essence of time because we uh we do want to keep this podcast at the right length here. Yep. We establish a hey, tax cuts and jobs. That's going to make your state tax issue uh, an issue for a lot of people. And it's going to make it worse for people that already have it. We establish, hey, illiquidity, illiquidity is a problem for a lot of families. We establish, hey, one strategy is an islet, an insurance, an insurance trust. And hey, there's liquidity here and there's a benefit to it. And now you could say, okay, hey, why don't I just go back to my buddy who does life insurance and set this thing up? And you, And if there's a good life insurance agent and they really understand these strategies probably works. However, oftentimes there is, we don't see that. We see pretty generic planning and there's some nuance to doing this type of planning that our firm is really good at. And so, right. The number one thing people, I'll just say it. People are like, Hey, insurance sounds great. That sounds like the right thing. I'm cool with some premiums, but I'll tell you what they hate. Chris, and you know what I'm going about to say is 15 years down the road, they don't like the premiums, right? Yeah. That's what, that's ultimately what it is. Or, Hey, I don't like it, you know, way out there in the future. How do I pay for this thing? Because yeah. there is a cost associated with it. 
there's I a cost the- and it's a benefit to the next, right? I mean, anytime you're paying something that, I mean, it's giving them comfort and it's buttoning the, you know, the next generation picture up, but, right. But anytime you have to continually come out of pocket um, for something that's a benefit to the next, right. It can, it can be uncomfortable at times, obviously. So how do we, how do we fix that? That's a great, that's a great question. Well, number one, you, you mentioned the planning. Um, yeah, our, our firm does, you know, very comprehensive planning. Uh, we take clients through engagements where, you know, we're, we're really, uh, you know, adding help with their income tax situation. And many times when we're doing that, right, we get the macro picture of their entire kind right. of financial, you know, you know, their, of their whole financial picture. And, um, and it's, we, we elegantly layer the insurance into that picture. Right. And so, we it's it's our well number one there's two types of life insurance policies for the for, for this type of structure uh one is what's called whole life and one is what's called universal life now this is not a knock on whole life or this is not a commercial for universal life but in, in this type of planning we tend to focus on universal life because it's typically has a better irr and what i mean by that is internal rate of return premiums going in to death benefit coming out it's going to yield a higher return um, uh, than, than the whole life is because the whole life is sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. You're not going to get the, the same leverage within the time period where we think the death benefit's going to pay out. So that said, going back to the planning piece, we, we like to, we like to kind of elegantly layer in the insurance to cut, co- to coincide with different planning strategies. And so many times what we're doing is we're minimum funding the structure up front to then get it out. A certain number of years. Let's say we put in anywhere from three to five five years of premium, right? And then we take a holiday. We take a premium holiday for anywhere from twenty to thirty five years. I um, like holidays. Yeah, holidays are nice, and the client likes them too. Now you might say, "Well, wait a second. That all sounds great, but what happens when the holiday ends, right? You have, we've all you know gone on a vacation, come back, you got a little, you know, you're a little down. You got to go back to the real world. Well, yeah. So when the premium kicks back up, right? When the vacation ends. We we have it structured but many times with the planning that we do and the different strategies to where that's gonna fi- that's gonna fulfill that need, right? There's gonna be some sort of resurgence of cash, some sort of inflow that's gonna be able to help service those premiums on on the back end. And so it this it's a way to optimize the IRR. It's a way to, you know, it's a way to add um add optionality into the plan. Cause because ultimately, look, again, as I said, we don't have the crystal ball. 20, 30 years out, we're gonna look at a client's health wealth, right? Liquidity situation, the legislative environment. And we're going to determine, hey, do we stay the course with this? Does it make sense? Do we do we drop a little bit of coverage? Maybe, maybe we need to add coverage, you know, assuming their health yep. is in good standing. Um, do we need to sell, you know, maybe their health isn't in good standing. Maybe we need to, but they have a liquidity issue. Maybe we need to sell a policy to pay for another one. And so by by dedicating the minimum amount of premium now to get the policy out, it gives us that optionality. We also I mean, let's be honest, we, we also don't necessarily want, um, or it's our motto to have a ton of money invested in a life insurance chassis um, nope. when it could be working on the outside. I mean, the insurers are typically work, you know, generating, I call it three to 5%, right, internally here. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd rather we'd rather dedica- dedicate cash to the outside, pay as minimum, and then deal with the premiums on the back end, if it's doable. Again, every client's different. So we're going we're gonna to optimize the premium design based on the uh, a particular client uh, situation. Another you thing need, that I think we let should me have, Let me hit on that real quick because sure I, it's just so dead on. Clients can make more money outside of those policies all day long, particularly business owners. Everybody can make more money in, out of an insurance policy than they can inside of it. So we minimum fund that thing. We'll try to do it the longest holiday we can. To your point, 20 years from now, we're going to make some decisions about your situation, right? And those clients, and one thing... You can't under it. You, you you just have to really grasp that concept that you just need to get it secured and make decisions later. And then what you were talking about, if I can just add to it, is like, what do you mean elegantly design something else? Well, if you're, let's say you do have a business and uh, you think it's going to hockey stick, right? You could take a small portion of that business, get it outside of your estate. That piece of that business grows outside of the estate. It turns into a big number you sell the business. Now you got a bunch of money outside the business and guess what? That money now funds the insurance, right? So it's those dovetailing of strategies. Like that's in the may not be the right strategy for you, but it might be the right strategy for somebody. There's lots of dovetailing of different strategies and trust designs to accommodate that holiday so that 20 years from now we can address, we already have the liquidity outside of the estate to pay for it. That's the trick. Get the money out there. 
how do you do it? Right. And so that's where we specialize. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll just add to that too, you know, depending on we're going to, we're going to tie into the level of coverage that the client needs, right? There's a lot of ways to do that, but you know, we're going to, we're going to determine a suitable amount based on a lot of factors. And we're also going to, you know, we're going to balance, right? Because if they need, you know, if it's, if it's deemed, they need 50, hundred million dollars of life insurance, you know, many times we, we don't want to put all that in one place, right? So we're going to diversify carrier. We're going to want to diversify product. You've got to tackle with the reinsurance piece of it. Um, some people are aware, but many don't know. Um, life insurance carriers don't keep all the risk on their books. They have automatic reinsurance treaties. They cede some of that risk to you know outside parties. Um, and so you kind of got to balance that marketplace. And so there's there's a lot of intricate planning that goes into this, especially when a client is worth enough where we have to put a significant liquidity bucket on the outside. We call it anywhere from north of 50 million of life insurance. Let me just put a plug in here. Chris is one of the smartest technical guys you'll ever meet. And when it comes to designing this stuff, somebody that wants to do the homework and just go beyond running one illustration, I can't tell you how much time gets into every case that we work on to get the right result and the negotiations that go on. Like Chris is the man, our team, like Chris, I love working with you, buddy. I just. Likewise, if, Kyle. If it didn't I'm, come across, I just got to say it. Too, too like, kind. He's the man. Too so. Kind, man. So this is isn't what a, it is, man. This isn't a vodcast, but I'm blushing no. right now. So thank you for that. So thanks, thanks for the kind words. And so I love working with you. On a separate note, we got to wrap this thing up. Hey, if this is something that is of interest to you, and you say, "Hey, I'm not sure my team has the sophistication and knows how to do the diligence and really negotiate these things and structure these things," we would love to talk to you. Uh, we can definitely help in some ways. We work with other uh, advisors as well. So if you have somebody you want to bring in, we do some joint case work and help other people. We don't covet uh, or try to harbor all of the strategies. We are firm believers that promoting what's best in the industry is better for everyone and makes everyone better in this industry. And and we live by that creed and we want to promote that and, and encourage other advisors and other professionals to work with us because that's how we get the great results for the clients. On a separate note, uh, our holiday party's coming up and I got to wear a, I'm a Chiefs fan and I lost a bet to Chris. He's an Eagles fan. So I'll be showing up at our holiday party in an Eagles sweatshirt. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that is exciting. That That is very exciting. We, we, we just got, we just got absolutely, um, you know, destroyed by the 49ers. This yeah, week. Did. So I'm not quite as high as I was well, after the well, Chiefs victory, well, but that said, it will be, you know, it will be, it will be like, it'll be great traveling out there to see as Kyle mentioned, I'm an Eagles fan. I'm from the Philadelphia area. And uh, it'd be nice to get out there and uh, see that uh, Eagle sweater in action. <laughs> yes, sir. Guys, how can someone get in touch with you? Well, if you found the podcast, I'm sure you can figure out how to get in touch with us. But just in case, uh, our webpage, www.centurawealth.com. It's probably the easiest. Phone number is 858-771-9500. You can figure it out from there, I think. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you for listening today. Please like, follow, and share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results.